So um, last week, we stopped at the false discovery rate. Then this week, we'll continue on to the resampling approach then before moving on to the lab. So all the methods that we did mention like last week's, it was taking the assumption that, I'm sorry, I need to scroll down. Is it here? Uh, okay. Yeah, so all those approaches that we were like using, so we kind of like know the theoretical now distribution. We always assume that some kind of like distributions like most probably will be like normal distributions. So what if we do not know the now distribution and it happens in the case where you have a very small sample size. In, when you have a large sample size, usually we just assume it's normal, but when you have a small sample size, most probably you do not know the distribution. So one way is to use this resampling approach. So we assume that using the permutation, so I'll go through the steps later. So we want to assume that the mean for the X and the mean for the Y would roughly be the same for the null hypothesis. So it means that you extract a certain populations from the X, then you extract a certain observations from Y, then you switch this X and Y. Then assuming that they have the same distribution, you should get the null to be like zero. Then this is the permutation approach. So you do have to compute T for all the original data where you have the X and the Y. Then you have the BB, let's say this is the number of permutations that you do want to run. Like let's say you run it very large, like 10,000. So when you permute all these observations at random, then you exchange them. Then after that, you commute the T results. Then you, after that, you have run a P value using this formula. So I'm not sure about how they actually arrive at this like P value. So I tried to follow the algorithm, but I just tried to follow the calculation, but it just didn't work. So just to recap, like, so if we really think that those distributions are similar, the expectation mean should be the same. Uh, so, okay, so this is one using the Khan data set. In the data set, you have about 2,308 genes and these are the genes computed for four types of cancers. So the first one, when they are trying to do is they try to compare the genes for those with this type of cancer. This, I will just keep the cancer B, then this is the other one, the cancer, the fourth type of cancer. So they're comparing the genes for these two types of cancer. And they run the resampling now distributions and the actual value of test statistics. So I'll go through this one later on in the lab on like how they actually arrive at these values. So um, in the first cancer group, they actually have about, I think 25, then the other sample group, they have about 29. So they try to swap the observations in these two groups. So, when they compare specifically on the gene 11, they found that the theoretical and the resampling now distributions, they are actually identical. So we just assume that there's actually no differences in the genes between the two cancer groups. But if they run it on the 877 genes, they found that there is actually a difference as in the theoretical p-value and the resampling p-value, they are quite different. So, but they didn't go into much theory that you show this example then, but they do mention that you have to be careful as in the smaller sample sets or like more skewed data distributions. So you're less likely to get an accurate theoretical now distributions. So in that case is better if you do, uh, so you will have the difference between the resampling and the theoretical now, the values will be more pronounced. Is that because theoretical tends to assume normality for things like this? Yeah. So, so the, re the resampling is always like correct. 
uh, resampling is like they just do not assume distrib any form of distributions. They just like go by random, like you need to have a specific values for the permutation, how many values that you want to permute. Then you compare. So we one of the thing of doing resampling is just for you to figure out what kind of distributions that you have for the small sample size. Then we talk about false discovery rate. So false discovery rate is similar to how we use the Benjamini Hodgepet procedure where you have to arrange your p values. Then we estimate the false discovery rate. So the plug-in for this is you have to select a threshold. So this C is some kind of like absolute value that you do have to select before prior to your analysis. So this M here refers to how many null hypotheses that you try to run. So you have to compute two things. One is you have to get the T value, then you do have to run the permutation, like the resampling method. Then if you remember the R, R is the total number of rejected hypotheses. So how many rejected hypotheses that you do so, and this R really depends on your FDR because FDR is the one that you set. You say you can set it to 10%, 20%, it's up to you. Your discovery rate is up to you. So your R is how many rejected hypotheses that you have. So if you set a higher FDR, you will have more, your R value will be higher as well. V is the estimated false positive in the sample. So if you, let's say, uh, let's say your R is 100 and you set your FDR to be 0 0.1, so your V estimated false, false positive will be about 10. And so they, this is just a figure where they show uh, two kind of like procedure. One is the BH, the Benjamini Hodgepet procedure. And the other one is using the resampling method. So it's about the same for these two false discovery rate estimates. So then they end with like, when are the resampling approaches useful? So they say it's useful when you do not know any theoretical null distribution, especially when your uh, sample size is smaller. So, and because this method do not require you to have any assumption. Then going on to the lab. So I didn't run, like this is what I got from the website. So they start with like reviewing how to perform like hypothesis testing. So using the t-test. Um, I think this is the fun data set where Oh, no, this is not the fun data set. So first they create like 100 variables. So this is the simulated data set. Yeah. So they set six, six, then they create 100 variables and each variable has 10 observations. So your M, which is your null hypothesis, you have about 100. So they set further separate that into a mean of 0 0.5 and a variance of one, while the others will have a mean of zero and a variance of one. So if you perform it, like let's say, they just look at one of the variables. So this is looking at variable one with 10 observation. They found it is significant, which is 0 0.06 because it's almost significant. Okay, so, so it's not significant, then which is not low enough for us to reject the alpha at 0 0.05. Okay, but they mentioned that this, right, the U here, if you look at the U, the mean one, I think the mean one here is 0 0.605. Mm, let me see. Yeah. In this case, the first mean, this first data set, the first 51, we should have a mean of 0 0.5. And this one is 
zero point six zero five. So they will say, oh, the now, I don't understand this part. Uh, but the p value comes up at zero point six seven. So I thought it was not significant. Mm. So then they further yeah, run uh, like. Sorry, mate. Mate, isn't that com yeah. uh, compared with the with an, uh, this this is uh, mu uh, mu equals to zero, so isn't it? Uh... Yeah, but there was at first I think I missed this part because this p I assume that is not significant, so you do not reject that. It's not quite low for yeah, it's not significant, so we do not reject that. Um, I don't know yeah. why but, I uh, forgot uh, why here. The, this uh, x uh, sample has a mean of 0 0.5. Is that right? This is the now mean, yeah. Okay, this is the 0 0.5. Mm, yeah. True mean. Yeah. So then he set this mu equal to zero. What is that? Mu equals to zero in the t test. Uh, so there, ah, that's yeah. Yeah, or they're nine. setting <laughs> they're setting the null hypothesis as the mu. the the mean is zero, and so we're saying, mm -hmm. can we reject that the mean is zero, and we can't reject that. So it's um, yeah, it's interesting to do as this first example because it's saying you know you fail to reject it even though we know that the true value is that it's not, the mean isn't zero, zero but yes, um, I guess just giving an example that failure to reject doesn't mean confirmation of that, you know, like. Mm. Um, type two errors are possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's just an example <laughs> of a type two error, yep. Okay, yeah, then after that they run like, 100 p values because we had 100 variables and they're trying to figure out which one is less or at least equal to 0 0.05 in the case where they, you would have rejected now so what they found is this is the table so they rejected about 13 so this is the r just to keep in mind first but the true decision is when the null is false, you do want to reject, but they only reject the 10 when the null is false. Then here, they only rejected 10, so it's very low. When the null is false, they do not reject it about 40. This is the false decision. Then when this is true, you should not reject that, which is okay. But then they make about three. So at the level of when they set it at alpha, like 0 0.05, you rejected 10 out of this 50, the false now hypothesis. So you incorrectly rejected that. Um, then they move on as in, this one I got confused and I went to Google about it. As in this one, I believe this is the coefficient of variance. Right? Because what they mentioned is the ratio of mean to the standard deviation. Like how I remember my stats was, it was the ratio of standard deviation to mean. Like they do it in the reverse way, which I assume then they mentioned that okay, so for the above stimulations for the false now hypothesis, you this one you have about 0 0.5 and this is quite a weak signal. That's why it's high. It's likely that you are likely to conduct a type two error. So yeah, if I, we I do- in maybe, maybe it's just because one, uh, so the, the, the square root of uh, one divided by 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. One divided by 0 0.5 is two, right? And then yeah. they, so it's like reversing things, mathematical uh, turn around that it then. Because yeah, you, because you, I, I thought you, you, this you, you, ratio you, you, is for us to compare uh, from data set to data set. Yeah. Yeah, so. So that's the so, this is the variance. 
So this is the mean to the standard deviation. So it's the square root of one divided by uh, 0.5, which is 0.5 divided by one, something like that. So the, the variance is, is one, uh -huh. and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. I don't know. <laughs> 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 yes so yeah should should be one divided by the square root of uh um, yeah like yeah, i really like spent hours like trying to figure <laughs> out this part <laughs> i think the i mean the takeaway is uh you know this is weak this isn't that big of a um mm. of a signal this the the variance is bigger than the mean so you're not likely to see anything Right, or it's not surprising that you can't can't tell. You know, I mean, mean to standard deviation is like signal to noise ratio. We're just kind of what they're. Yeah, so they're saying there isn't much signal here, but then they do the thing where they, you know, let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's make the mean uh, actually as big as the, the variance at least. Um, yeah, and then there's fewer type two errors. Yes. So when the null is false, then you do not reject that. That's in earlier it was about 40, and now it has decreased up to nine. Then we move on to the family wise error rate. So remember, this one was we did not set, like we did not control for the family wise error rate, means we set our alpha to be 0 0.05. So for this one, because we're running multiple testing, so we do want to set our family-wise error rates to be the alpha, let's say 0 0.05. So here we have 500 now hypothesis, means we run 500 tests. Then I think they compute this for the first three. So they have one, so this is alpha 0 0.05, this is alpha 0 0.01 and 0 0.03. So the following plot bottom here is what you got from the textbook where as the number of hypotheses increases, you will see we are more likely to come, like to get like higher family-wise error rate. Then the red one is the zero point, the alpha where you set at 0 0.05, and green one is where you have alpha at 0 0.00001. Yeah. So we discussed pro like previously, even though it, let's say we only have a moderate M, let's say we only have 15 now hypotheses, your family wise error rate was still at 0 0.05 unless you set your alpha to very low value, such as 0, 0.0. But then the problem with setting such a low alpha is you're more likely to make a type 2 errors, then which means your power of your study will be like very low. So back to this fun data set which we talked about last week. Um, so we're trying to compare like run t-test for the first five managers in the data set. So we only look at the first five manager and the first one is we run the t-test for just the manager one. This is just a t-test on the first manager and we found that the p-value is 0 0.006, which is significant. And this only like the performance is like above average for the manager. Then if we run, a, let's say we just try to extract the p-value for manager one to five, you realize that manager one and manager five has lower p, they both have lower p-values compared to manager two, four, and five. Okay, so if you do not control for the family-wise error rate, you will just recheck like the now for the manager one and manager three, but we cannot do that since we will fail to account for those like multiple testing that we have performed. So we can do two ways. One is either you do the correction using the Bonferroni method or the Holmes method to control for the error rate. 
So we can use something called the p.adjust function, where in here the, you can specify the method that you do want. Like in this, if we do set the alpha to be for bond ferroni method, if we set the alpha to be 0 0.05, now your new value, like the threshold will be, we have, since we have five testing, so it will be 0 0.01. So any lower than 0 0.01 will be rejected. So what happens is using the bond ferro method, they say that we only manage to reject the null hypothesis for the first manager because only the manager one is below 0 0.01. Okay, but then if bond ferro method is very stringent, so you're less likely to reject uh, the hypothesis. So what is suggested is like try to use Holmes method, which is in which we arrange all the p values uh, from in the increasing order, means from the lowest p value to the highest p value. Then from there we compute another value using the uh, calculation. You do have to recalculate the adjusted the p values. Then, but we don't have to do the. Sorry, mm. yes, I'll interrupt you. What, what's the difference uh, between P adjust? No, can you just go back there? The, the adjust? Function. Yeah, P adjust and P min. What's the difference between the two? This is the minimum, I think. This is the where they get the fund and they times five. Mm, let me think. Uh, because they said they have to set, I remember when I was reading it last week was, uh, they said they don't allow the P adjusted p-values to exceed one. So this is the setting the limit there. But for me was, I was looking at here, the p-values because these are the five p-values. So I know the threshold was like 0 0.01. So I was looking at which one to reject and which one not to reject based on these p-values. I, I, in the this text one. of the book, they yeah. didn't adjust the p-values. They just adjusted the threshold you compared the p-values to. But it looks like here they're saying just for convenience, apply the adjustment to the p-values so you can just compare them all to the same threshold, right? That's what's going on here. I'm sorry, can we repeat? <laughs> so the what some of the methods for correcting for multiple testing involve a moving target for the p-values. So you compare different p-values against different thresholds. And you, you sort the p-values in order, and then you mm -hmm. get a different threshold for each one. But that I guess that can be a little, maybe, maybe it's simpler just to think about the comparison as you just adjust the p-values themselves so you can compare them all to the same threshold, right? That's, that's, what's, that's what's going on here yeah. with the adjusted p-values, right? Like for bond, yeah, like for bond, you do have a fixed threshold for everyone. And that's just a, but it, adjusting the, the values rather than adjusting the threshold is just a matter of preference and like simplicity, mm. right? Yeah. Okay. And, you know, as far as like what they're showing there with the P men, they're just, they're like showing what the P adjust is doing basically so the two calls you know they get the same result because bonferroni is going to multiply the p by the number of managers but with a max of one um and so this that's is... what they're doing yeah yeah because the five there is the number of total number of uh, hypotheses yeah no so, yeah okay <laughs> Like then back to like Holmes method just for recap. So we do have to specify the alpha for this method. This is a step down where you have to rearrange all your p-values from the smallest to the highest. Then you do need to find the L, which is usually computed using this method, which is you have 0 0.05, then five plus one minus one, which is 
where's the this one n plus one minus j so this one j this represents like one two three is the position after you have a rearranged shape so you just want to make sure your p-value is always lesser than the new adjusted p-values that we have computed the threshold the new adjusted threshold so the method is the same where you just adjust the method then in this case the first, um, using Holmes method, we able to reject the null hypothesis for manager one and manager three. So they do manage to reject the null hypothesis for manager one and manager three. But if we do look at the mean for manager one to manager five, you should realize manager one and manager three has like higher mean compared to the rest of the managers in the team. So is there evidence for any meaningful differences in the performance between these two managers is, if we just specifically look into manager one versus manager three, we find that, oh yeah, that it's is the meaning. One versus difference. two is what they're looking at, not one versus three. Oh, sorry. Okay. It was one versus three. Uh, one versus two, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about two, but I guess, yeah, it's one versus two. Then there is a difference, but the problem with this is we only decided to perform this test after we look at the data and after we perform all the analysis, then we realized, yeah, manager one has the highest mean and manager two has the lowest mean. So means we have implicitly performed a lot of multiple testing without realizing us doing so. So this one was, they say we were doing like 10 hypothesis testing means out of the five, we only like purposely selected two out the combination, like five out of two, and we actually have like 10 hypothesis tests. So what we can do if we do want to like look into specific groups, we do have to adjust for the p-values. We can use something like the turkey's HSD function to adjust for the multiple testing. So this one, they say this function is just you taking the regression model, the output, then you look at the uh, return by each manager. So the predictor is the manager and the response is the access returns by each manager. Uh, what else? Huh? Okay, so this was just the model where return is this manager and the key they set it here. So what they found is these are the 10 combination and their differences. The key will return you the adjusted p-value as well as the confidence interval. So you will get the lower and the upper limit for each combination. Okay, and all these has been adjusted for multiple testing. So if we specifically look into just now was manager one and two. So the first row, this row, our p-value now is 0 0.186 compared to previously it was 0 0.038, which was significant and now it's no longer significant. So we can also, this is just the plot showing you like manager one, the first row, the first line, sorry. First line, here's the confidence interval. So now, after controlling for multiple testing, so the differences between manager one and manager two are no longer significant. Next is the false discovery. Okay. So we have 2,000 fund managers in the data set. So think of like 2,000 subjects, participants then we do want to run a p-value for each of, let's say, each fund managers, they have about 10 observations. Under each manager, we have about 10 observations. 
we do want to look at their performance. So we run like 2000 tests to get their p-value. Okay, so one thing is now you have about 2000. So they say is you have too many managers for me to even consider trying to control the family-wise average rate. So we can't use like Bonferroni or the Holmes method. So instead, we do want to focus on controlling the false discovery rate, which is out of how many rejected hypotheses that you have, like you want to make sure what are the proportion of rejected hypotheses that are actually false positives. So using the same method, you're still using the p adjust function, but this time you just have to change your method to pH. And you should get about 2,000 times 10, 20,000, but we only look at the Q values for the first 10. So the Q values, they say, remember like for Benjamin Hodgepert is, you have this Q value where it's the smallest false discovery rate threshold. So false discovery rate, False discovery rate is very data dependent. So it depends on what are the p-values that you have computed. We look at what are the smallest um, rate that threshold that you can actually get. So uh, Q0.1 means about 10%, then you want to reject anything like 10%. Mm. So from the data set, if you run through, so if you reject anything less than or equals to Q, anything less than or equals to 10%, 10 so we out of like 2,000, we realize that we have 146 managers with Q value below 0 0.1. So we can conclude like these managers, they meet beat the market at the FDR of 10%. So out of this 146, 10% is 10% is 14.6. So about 15 fund managers are more, out of this 146 rejected hypothesis, 15 will be the false positive, means the false discovery. If we have use the bond for any, we wouldn't have rejected any of the null hypothesis because even that at the 0 0.1, you have to divide by 2000, that's really low alpha value for you to reject. Uh, then we also, so this is just the functions where they're trying to sort the p-values for the 2000 p-values sorting it then this will get you about 2000 the q is 0 0.1 so anything q times uh, this is what's the value per m so this is your v over r and so they first order the p-values, then they identify all the p-values that is as lower than the computed uh, adjusted p-values. Then the index or what they did was here was just indexing all the p-values that is lesser than the adjusted p-values. So this is the figure that was presented in the textbook. So they rejected, I think, this one was 146. So this is a stimulated data set. So the blue ones are all the false, uh, false null hypothesis. So out of this false null hypothesis, they rejected everything below the red line. So they rejected about here, all these cluster of dots here, they rejected about 146. So this green line is actually the Bonferroni method. So they did not manage to reject any of the false null hypothesis using this Bonferroni method. Okay, this one I have to go a bit slow. Uh, the resampling approach, 
Okay, so I was looking into the data set. So this data set has four distinct cell cancers, like cancerous cell. So each of these like subjects, usually that they have like these tissue samples, they have 2,308 gene expression. So I was looking, they have about 60, not 63, they have 83 subjects, which they separate into two data set. One is 63 and one is like 20. So the 63 is the training data set and the training X train and the Y train versus then the other 20 is the uh, 20 is the X test and the Y test. I think they mentioned it wrongly here. Uh, so what is in this data set is, back to here. So in this data set, you actually have that 2,308, so 83 subjects. Then this one, two, three, four are the four cancer types. If you can see, like uh, we are specifically, we do want to look into two and four. So cancer type two, cancer type four. Mm. So what we can do for each of this gene, you have about 2,308 genes. You compare the mean expression in the second, for the second cancer versus the mean expressions or the gene expression in the fourth class of the cancerous cell. So if we just specifically perform two standard t-tests on the 11 genes, it will get us a stats of like t-stats about negative 2.09 with a p-value of 0 0.042. So this is the theoretical now hypothesis. So what you do in resampling is Okay, because that one is a theoretical null hypothesis. That's how we usually compute our p-value. So for resampling method, what you wanted to do is we randomly split the participants regardless of which group they belong. You randomly split them into two groups. One is group of 29 and 25. So we just split them then assuming that if the distribution are the same, so when we split them randomly into groups, we should get back about the same t-values and the same p-values. Okay, so assuming that under the now about this is there's no differences in the distribution between the two groups, the new stats that you get should have the original values or approximately original values. So B, this one is U setting permutation to 10,000. And for each of the items, we create a matrix then, you create a vector then, for each of the things, you run a t-test, and then we try to extract. So this one is the resampling p-value. Uh, previously, it was, 0 0.0411 and now is 0 0.0416. So it's almost identical to your theoretical now p-value. So we assume that their distribution would be about the same, which we can run a histogram to look at it. So you can see the red line and the yellow distributions, they are about the same because our values are about the same as well, the p-values. So what is interesting is we do want to do something called the plug-in resampling for cis-power rate approach. This one really depends on your speed of computer. So uh, it be due to the because the process will take a long time, what they did was they set the, they just take a subset of the genes. So instead of, of 2,308 genes, they just run 
the analysis on the 100 genes. Then you compute the stats, the T value, then you do a permutation, then you reproduce the test statistics. So we just run it 10, what, sorry, 1000 permutation. So back to here. <laughs> So for this plug-in resampling, you have to compute a T value. Then after that, where you set a B, the number of permutation, you decide the B. And then you do have to permute this at randoms, then compute a new T. Then we want to combine the R, which is R represents like number of rejected hypotheses, and B is estimated. Uh, false positive from that value. So here, this part here, is just referring to this, where you have the permutations, you get the T values and then the T. Then define the R, you compute the number of rejected now hypothesis. Uh, first you need to sort it, obviously. Now that you need to compute the number of rejected null hypotheses, and we also get the estimated false positive, the V. We can also get the estimated false discovery rate, which is V over R. So for any of the FDR, let's say if we had set it the FDR at um, because FDI is up to us. So FDI, if you set it at a more stringent criteria at 0 0.1, out of these 100 now hypotheses, what they run is they manage to reject 15. Then out of 15, because we set at 0 0.1, you rejected 10% is 1.5, means you rejected about two. Two like two out of 15 will be the false positive. Then if you set your FDR at 0 0.2, you will get, you will reject about 28 now hypothesis. Means 10, 0 0.2, that will be about 5.6. So you will reject about six. Six out of 28 will be the false discovery. So this is just sorting when they compute the new values. So conclusion is because they only run on the subset. So the, as the number of rejection, then this is the final notes, nothing. So this is, you should realize it's like, if you set a higher false discovery rate, you're more likely to get higher number of rejections. So that's the one in the book. So I was really confused about the way they run multiple testing. So I look at other packages that we could use to run, like to make the life easier for us to use. One is like the one that suggested in the book is this SAMR SAMR package, which is I think what they use for those, uh, not this one. SAMR package is this one the significant analysis of microarrays. I also found other people have used this, like more of the, this one has like a lot of like to, more tutorials on how to use this package, which is the mouth test one. This one is using, this is helpful for resampling. If you want to do a resampling, multiple hypothesis testing. I think they use it in biostats. Another new world one is this, I did not see any tutorials, but they have this package called N rejections. And it seems to have more of the functions that, especially for resampling. And you can also run a simulated data set. So that's all for me. Awesome. That, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, I like, and I don't have the intuition to think like a statistician and go, oh, we were comparing like, um, 
way up. We're comparing the um, best performer to the worst performer. That means technically we did all the comparisons in between. And so we have to take that into account. Like I can feel like I have a feel for, okay, if we're looking at best versus worst, we're doing something, you know, we've already made some decisions there, but, but yeah. seeing it as, oh no, you technically, you did all the, you also did all the comparisons in between. So you have to think of that as multiple testing. That, that kind of thing is useful for me to see <laughs> as a non-statistician, um, just trying to think that way. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Anyone else like, have, have anything? To, yeah, do I have to upload my notes? If you can, that would be great. Okay, I'll try to do it. <laughs> that would be and, oh, next week. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, that's it. Yes. That's the book. We made it through. A uh, couple of you have made it through like one and a half times now. So uh, I don't think that's a terrible idea. I might have to do this book club again sometime. Um, so now we are part of the censored data set. We are. We, uh, we never. Uh, in the study. Yeah. <laughs> Never, never uh, failed, whatever. Um, we never, never died. We survived. Uh, awesome. If anyone or no one has anything else, I guess that is it. I will not see you next week. <laughs> Bye.